Hey there, welcome back to the Intergenerational Trauma Therapist Show, where today we are moving into developmental trauma for the month of June. And today we'll be talking about recognizing developmental trauma in children and adolescents. Um, so we will be covering understanding what developmental trauma is, the impacts of trauma on their development, attachment disruptions and how those are traumatic, behavioral and emotional cues of developmental trauma, impacts of developmental trauma in adolescence, which is really important because that is where sometimes it can become very apparent that there's been impacts that may have gone unnoticed. And then we'll also look at some assessments for developmental trauma as well. Um, the importance of addressing developmental trauma early cannot be emphasized enough. This is where we can influence the next generation to not have the same degree or have the impacts of intergenerational trauma. If we can help the children to mitigate those impacts of developmental trauma, it's less likely to be carried over into the next generation. Understanding developmental trauma, we have to look at some of the definitions and van der Kolk and I think it's Spinozola's definition has two basic parts to it. First, there's experiences of traumatic incidents during developmental periods. So between birth and 18 or 21, there's specific traumatic incidents that have happened, usually much more than just one. Um, and it in includes a component of relational trauma. So there's some attachment impacts that have occurred because of the trauma um, in these early years. <clears throat> so developmental trauma is significantly different from other types of like single incident trauma um, because of those developmental impacts. Developmental trauma, it, it, it's chronic, it happens over longer periods of time, and it disrupts development, which makes it very much more impactful and difficult. So single incident trauma, you'll usually see the symptoms of PTSD. So you'll see hypervigilance, suspiciousness, kind of paranoia in relationships, high reactivity. You'll see avoidance of things that remind them of the trauma. You'll also have intrusions, so that's like bad dreams, flashbacks, memories, um, things that kind of intrude in the here and now that are related to the traumatic incident, and changes in cognition and mood. So that's the world is no longer a safe place. People are terrible. You'll never be safe, um, and the world is out to get you. So it's those kind of changes in cognition and mood that we'll see with single incident trauma. The impact of developmental trauma is much more significant and disruptive to developmental tasks, um, which creates a cascade of impacts that are disrupted to several life domains. So they still have the hypervigilance, the avoidance, the intrusions, and the changes in cognition and mood, but they also have additional impacts on attachment, biological development, affect regulation, dissociation, behavioral control, cognition, and self-concept. So there's huge impacts that can happen when there's developmental trauma. And this is why it's so important to address these as early as we can. So developmental trauma has much greater impacts that are destructive to many life domains than a single incident trauma. And intergenerational trauma by nature is developmental trauma due to the impacts of the parent-child relationship and the difficulties in attachment and parenting that can come when a parent has unresolved complex trauma. So when working with intergenerational trauma, unresolved developmental trauma in a child, as they age, it transitions into unresolved complex trauma as an adult or parent. So some people call it complex developmental trauma. I like to make that distinction so that therapists, um, treatment professionals, and parents 
and um, that they understand that there's there's different variations as the person ages. And if we can stop it at one, it doesn't evolve into the next thing and it doesn't get transmitted. <clears throat> so when we look at it as um, distinguishing complex trauma from de developmental trauma, it gives a clear understanding of how to address it to arrest that transmission. It also supports the parents understanding that they're doing the best they can. They've been impacted by their circumstances as well. And this can really help decrease shame for them. <clears throat> The impact of neglect on development is very significant as well. So neglect sometimes is seen as kind of a silent trauma. It's what wasn't there. So it's the absence of positive relationships. It's the absence of co-regulation. It's the absence of food, safety, warmth. Um, <clears throat> and it really has a huge impact. And the impacts of developmental trauma on those domains um, we're going to go through those one by one. First, we're going to look at attachment. So developmental trauma can cause difficulties with boundaries, either asserting boundaries, knowing where boundaries should be for yourself and others. So people can become very intrusive. Kids can interject themselves in places that they, they really don't have the boundaries kind of say that they shouldn't be interjecting there. They have difficulty understanding others' emotions because they haven't had that co-regulation. And my notes just did something really crazy. So we'll get back. They may feel disconnected or isolated in relationships. It's hard for them to build relationships with other people. Or they may have defensive or controlling relational strategies, which can be really problematic and very destructive to future relationships. With biological development, there can be difficulties with sensory development and sensory integration. So sen sensory information may become very overwhelming or they may not be able to process it, which is going to impact language, communication, behavior, all of that. Also with biological development, cr chronic illnesses that are auto more autoimmune conditions are typically linked back to some type of developmental trauma. There's also somatization. So the child may <clears throat> end up expressing stress or depression, anxiety, it's physical complaints. So you'll see headaches, stomach aches, all those kinds of things that um, it's in the body and they can't recognize it as related to an emotion or a feeling. And they also have very low muscle tone. So if you've ever seen a child that is um, has experienced developmental trauma, a lot of times they'll have very low muscle tones. So the coordination is difficult. Um, their strength is difficult, which um, is really important for overall health and well-being. Affect regulation is another area um, that can be difficult. So that they may have difficulty recognizing emotions. They can't self-regulate their emotional responses because they haven't had the co-regulation to build that self-regulation. They may be very disconnected from themselves or internal state. So they won't recognize like that pit in the stomach feeling when something is kind of not, not good or that they're detecting some type of danger. Um, they may be highly dysregulated, so very emotionally reactive, or they may be very shut down and not have a wide range of emotional responses. <clears throat> Dissociation is a brilliant strategy that can be life-saving, but it be because it impacts the, it minimizes the threat and increases chances of survival. The difficulty is if it's too intense, if it lasts too long and is in too many areas of life, um, you can have a lot of difficulties with um, self-alienation, so not being aware of internal cues, thoughts, feelings. Um, you can have a lot of disconnection to your own experiences and internal experiences. So it can be very disruptive, and it's also a hallmark of intergenerational trauma. <clears throat> 
behavioral control. So now we're talking about impulse control, aggression, self-destructive behavior. So there can be some huge difficulties with being able to self-regulate behavior and learn those behavioral control, usually through co-regulation, and they can develop very difficult negative coping strategies. So you can see head banging, self-harm, um, suicidal behavior, all of those kinds of substance abuse relationships, all of that can become very negative coping strategies that helps them regulate behavior and emotions, but it causes other problems. They can also be very defensive or overly compliant. Um, they have difficulties with rules. They can apply rules in, in different situations, or they may not feel like they apply to them, or they may apply to other people, but not them. Um, and they may, at times you'll see reenactment of trauma, either aggression, sometimes sexualized behavior, because they're trying to work through this and they don't have the behavioral control to not do it. So they repeat these over and over. And the brain is just trying to make sense of what's happened. Um, but it can become a problem when there's too much aggression in play or too much, um, too many boundary violations related to peers, things like that. So that behavioral control can be very difficult as well. The next domain of impact is cognition. So you'll see a lot of executive dysfunction. So that will include difficulties with regulating attention, focusing, concentrating, um, sustaining attention during problem solving, completing a task and bringing it to completion or shifting to a new task when you're in the middle of another task, which can become very difficult, difficulty with new situations. You can also see learning and language difficulties and difficulties with planning and problem solving. So huge cognitive impacts. With self-concept, you'll see difficulties with self-identity. They may not have a sense of self, what they believe in, what they stand for, what they'll tolerate in relationships. They may become very enmeshed with other people for identity. Um, so they'll identify with one group of people and then they'll be with another group of people and they'll more identify with them. And there's not stability between the two groups of people. There may be body image disturbances. So this, this is where you can see eating disorders. There's low self-esteem, excessive shame and guilt that really negatively impacts many life domains, mainly relationships and um productivity, work, education, all those kinds of areas of life. So when intervention is provided to address the developmental impacts, it decreases the impact on the current generation, the current child, decreases the impacts on, of the child's developmental trauma on the parent, um, and it also arrests the transmission of intergenerational trauma to following generations. This is why treating developmental trauma is so critical. <clears throat> so when you do intervene and try to mitigate these effects, some impacts may remain, but the degree may in the intensity may decrease, or you'll be able to address several domains. Um, one domain may remain active, like say they're learning, they have learning difficulties, but their behavioral control is regulated and their affect is regulated. So you may see some impacts remain, um, but you will see the duration or the degree and intensity decrease. And it may take more than one generation to fully arrest the transmission because it's so impactful um, that it, sometimes the impact on those developmental domains is such that it takes several generations to completely mitigate that or fully arrest that transmission. Your interventions may need to be multidisciplinary. So they may need to include occupational therapy, physical therapy, medical, psychological, educational, because of the wide variety of impact across life domains. Um, so addressing these developmental impacts along with the unresolved complex trauma in the parent can have a huge synergistic effect on healing.
So it'll increase hope and commitment. It will decrease the traumatic cycle between parents and children um, and supports improvement in, in attachment. That's really the core of what we wanna work towards with um, developmental trauma and intergenerational trauma. And it reduces the current relational trauma. So it's really important um, to address these, both the unresolved complex trauma of the parent and the developmental trauma of the child. Now we'll look at attachment disruptions and their role in how they impact the trauma and the symptoms. So very brief explanation of attachment theory. Basically attachment is a safe base that um, supports the child to go explore, have safety to come back to, it supports co-regulation and eventually supports the development of skills for self-regulation. It supports relationships. Um, it impacts every area of life. So it's very important. So strategies kind of broadly include secure. That's you can leave and come back and there's maybe a little distress, but it resolves quickly. Anxious, that's preoccupied, chasing, pursuing, um, a caregiver or an attachment figure. Avoidant, which is shutting down um, and not really engaging, kind of being aloof or dismissive. However, their nervous system is still always looking for attachment. And then that category of disorganized, which sometimes isn't the best label, but um, it, it does kind of conceptualize a mix between the anxious and avoidant. So it'll be like a come here, go away, I hate you, don't leave me kind of thing. Um, and there's three subtypes of this one. There's a punitive controlling where they're demanding bossy prescriptive. There's caregiving, which is basically your parentified child. And then there's disorganized, which is very unpredictable, and it's hard to figure out what the cues and the triggers are for the, the behavior related to attachment. These attachment strategy, strategies, interestingly, can be very different between caregivers. So they can have a secure attachment with one caregiver and then have an anxious or avoidant attachment with another one. Or they may have a disorganized attachment with one person and have more of an anxious attachment with another. So these strategies aren't fixed in stone. These are kind of, they develop over time and they kind of shift for what the needs in that relationship are. So neglect may go unnoticed because it's the absence of relating relational or um, physical needs rather than a traumatic incident or an injury. Some people refer to this as a little t trauma. I don't really like using that term because these aren't little t's. They're, they go unnoticed and they're not recognized because they're not a big upheaval of life, but they're extremely impactful and sometimes more impactful than the big incidents of trauma. <clears throat> So disruptions in attachment lead to some trauma symptoms. When, they, when kids have disrupted or complicated attachments, they're by nature traumatic due to the impact on the nervous system. So the lack of access to co-regulation with a caregiver leads to greater sensitivity to threat and danger. The world just is not a safe place if you don't have a caregiver that you can run back to and get comfort. Neuroception of danger and safety may be faulty, so it may result in greater relational disruptions or detection of threat when it's not there or lack of any detection of threat. And the dysregulation of the nervous system is pretty impactful as well. So these difficulties can increase the child's vulnerability due to the faulty neuroception. So if they detect threat everywhere and they're engaging in um, aggressive behavior towards peers, they're more likely to have more trauma based on those interactions. And they, they have difficulties co-regulating and self-regulating. So the impacts of that really cascade down. Some unexpected attachment difficulties or disruptions that sometimes go missed are include medical trauma. So if a child has had a significant medical illness that has required hospitalization, 
being away from caregivers, that can be very impactful. Separation from caregivers, if they go away in the military, if they move and they have to be separated for a period of time from one parent, um, medical illness in a caregiver, mental health or substance abuse difficulties in caregivers can, these are real life scenarios that can be missed as being factors of trauma for these kids. So now we're gonna look at behavioral emotional cues for developmental trauma. So the most common behavioral signs are kind of on a, a continuum of aggression to withdraw, and there's all kinds of area in between there. So you'll see a lot of hypervigilance, especially in relationships that are very distrustful. They won't, um, they won't believe an adult if they tell them that they did something, they'll wanna check and make sure that the adult did that. Um, they may have excessive reactivity to stressors, so their reactions may be much greater than what would be expected for the situation. And they can have excessive defensiveness. So they can quickly detect threat and react to that in a way that pushes other people away or may harm other people. There's also a, a high probability of having faulty neuroception. And this is the detection of danger when there really isn't any danger present it can also be the inability to detect danger. So the whole world could be crashing down around them and they just go on with normal life because they've lived in these conditions that they no longer detect danger, um, which can completely makes them much more vulnerable to more trauma. Um, so they can have withdrawal or internalizing difficulties. So you'll see stomach aches, headaches, Isolation from caregivers and peers, there's maybe a lack of relationships or kind of relational or emotional isolation. The emotional symptoms typically cluster around anxiety, depression, and trauma. So there can be significant emotion, dysregulation, and sensitivity. They can't self-regulate. They can't recognize emotional responses in themselves or others. They have excessive anxiety or nervousness, may have a lot of reactivity, greater reactivity to a, a stressor than what would be expected. Or their nervous system may just be shut down. With A lot of times when you see a shut down nervous system, you'll see symptoms of depression. And shame and guilt are really important in looking at the impacts for these kids because they grow up feeling like they're a bad kid or they're damaged. And these are those faulty self-beliefs that develop where they can't fact check what the, the pattern that the brain interpreted. They can't fact check it. So they just believe that I made a big noise. Mom got mad. I'm a bad kid rather than mom might have some anger issues or mom may have been really stressed out. So how do we differentiate these impacts from other behavioral issues. This can be a really difficult thing to do sometimes. And it's most important when you need a diagnosis for other referrals or additional services, possibly like medication for ADHD, it's really, it becomes really important to differentiate these under those circumstances and with treatment planning. So one thing is to consider the contrast between when the child may have a sense of safety, if you can kind of get a hold of a period in time or a situation where they had a sense of safety, were the symptoms still there? Or is this is there neuroception of threat and danger causing them to be more impulsive and reactive? So we wanna also identify triggers for behavior and determine if they're pervasive, if they're in many environments like school, home, sports, or um, if they're trauma related. So a difference may be if they're pervasive, they may have sensory overload in school, at home. They don't like a lot of noise. They need kind of to muffle that out and to really kind of manage the sensory input that they get. Or is it trauma related when they hear a siren, that it's the siren that does it rather than the overall sensory overload? So interventions may overlap and really a transdiagnostic approach to address root symptoms 
unless medical intervention is necessary. That may be the most useful um, with specific adjustments for a particular child in their situation. So if we overlook developmental trauma, there's huge long-term effects in many life domains, including mental health, social relationships, educational outcomes. Um, there's higher rates of depression, anxiety, and trauma-related impacts. Relationships become more complicated, and they may be very isolated or very unstable. So it creates a further sense of distance from other people. Increased reactivity leads to unstable adult relationships in life. Um, so it creates this instability where they never get those attachment needs met unless these, these impacts are resolved. Relationships are critical for well-being and physical health, health. So that if there's high rates of loneliness or personal isolation, there's usually poorer health outcomes. So this is where having healthy relationships is really important for um, children with developmental trauma, adults with complex trauma, intergenerational trauma. Those relationships are really critical. They may also have, if we don't address these impacts, they may have higher rates of vulnerability to additional trauma as teens and adults. So they may have faulty neuroception where they either detect danger when it's not there or don't detect it when it is there. And they're unable to detect this, which prevents them from appropriate defensive reactions. So they may not react to somebody who could harm them and they get harmed or they may react quicker to somebody who really wasn't going to harm them and then they get harmed as well. The increased reactivity that they experience may also make them more vulnerable to trauma because they may become more aggressive than the situation needs. So their, their level of reactivity can be like a rocket rather than a bicycle. So they can really have um, excessive aggressive behavior um, if they have that increased reactivity. There can also be a huge sense of isolation and loneliness, um, being different from other people, which makes it hard for them to have sustainable relationships. There's societal impacts of untreated developmental trauma. You'll see later in life increased social problems, you'll see crime, violent substance abuse, um, being unhoused, unemployment, all of those types of issues sometimes are rooted and linked into early developmental trauma, substance abuse. Um, there can be increased pressure on social services. So this is your child welfare and child protection, mental health, medical systems. There's loss of potential and productivity. Some of these kids are just, they're brilliant they have such good skills, but the impacts of the trauma that they've experienced kind of prevent any of that from being accessed because they're always in defense mode. So early intervention can mitigate some of the impacts and prevent negative outcomes for the individual, the next generation, and society. That's why it's very important that we are aware of developmental trauma and can treat it effectively. So if we mitigate these impacts during childhood and teen years, there's less pressure on societal sy systems, there's better health and mental health and physical health outcomes. And intervention in the unresolved complex trauma of the caregiver or parent, it can be considered early intervention because it's gonna impact that relationship with their child which will help address that developmental trauma. So this is where having the caregiver involved in therapy and treatment and resolving their own unresolved trauma is very important. So let's look at adolescents because they are in a developmental period that is really tasked with specific things that they need to do. And basically they are developmentally tasked with establishing their identity separate from caregivers, parents, finding out who they are, what they believe in. Um, so without that secure base and healthy attachment, this developmental period 
can be very significantly impacted. So you can see defiance and rejection of adult influence. Um, that some people call this defensive dominance, which leads to poor decision, high risk behaviors. They're more focused on being different than their parents. So they may go into criminal behavior or they may align themselves with a negative peer culture group. Um, so it's really important that when they, they start to make this separation, that they still have that safe base to come back to. You can also see increased vulnerability to mental health difficulties during this period. It, adolescence is just a high risk time overall for mental health difficulties, and especially in our current society with all the negative things that have happened and um, social media. So this is really important to recognize the vulnerability to mental health during this period especially when they've had attachment disruptions as children. Um, you can see a lot more vulnerability because everything kind of blossoms when the nervous system prunes back what wasn't used, like you're a good kid and people love you, and it accelerates what was laid down of you've been through how many foster homes and you don't really have any connections. That's where the vulnerability for adolescents really comes in. It's in that brain development and that need to make a, make a shift to your own identity development. So differences in symptoms between younger kids and adolescents, you'll see this in separation. The separation is really the big issue here. Children aren't tasked with separation like adolescents are. So children may have defiance, but it's within a relationship rather than contributing to cutoffs in relationships. So you may see teens that just cut off relationships, they run away, and that's the way they handle dealing with difficult relationships. So adolescents are at higher risk for cutting off complicated relationships due to this developmental phase where they're tasked with separation. It also increases their vulnerability and potential for negative coping strategies because they aren't developmentally and financially, emotionally capable of being completely cut off or separate from caregivers. So it's a really vulnerable time for teens and adolescents. Also in adolescents, there's a peer orientation that starts to um, shift where teens are more drawn to their peer groups than adults and they're away from parental influence. So they continue to need that parental influence or adult influence, but they may be shut down to these connections due to the complications with separation and forming their identity. It's too complicated for some of these kids to remain in relationship and forge their identity at the same time. So that's where we have to watch for peer orientation and kind of what kind of influences their peer group may have on them may also see higher risk behavior. So this may be related to peer orientation, may be related to just nervous system regulation. So they may start using substances to self-regulate. They may engage in criminal behavior due to the peer group that they're in or those influences and the, the need to define themselves as something different from what they were before or from their family or they may align with a caregiver or a parent who's also involved in crime. So this creates a false sense of attachment based on mutual high-risk activity. So this is really important with adolescents who've had significant attachment disruptions. I've had some that um, they carjack and they feel numb and totally checked out until they carjack someone and they just feel so alive. They never felt that alive in their lives. That's that nervous system regulation that they're coming out of a kind of dissociated, numbed, checked out state and going into that sympathetic, but it's got huge consequences. There's also more significant mental health difficulties. There's increased rates of suicide and self-harm, anxiety, depression, all of those. So it's really important to look at the risk in these factors in adolescents. So they can be placed at higher risk for, risk for things like trafficking. 
They need independence and autonomy, but they also need attachment or affection from adults or peers. So it puts them very high risk for being in situations that are very detrimental, like trafficking. They can have higher rates of substance abuse, so difficulties coping with previous trauma or identification with parents or family through substance abuse, and then that peer orientation and acceptance. <clears throat> That criminal behavior, particularly if they're numb, checked out in that dorsal vagal state primarily, they feel alive when they engage in criminal behavior. So finding other, maybe somewhat high risk activities that are healthier would be a good um, way to help them self-regulate with that. So assessments for developmental trauma, there's tons of assessments that can be used. Um, so we're just gonna do a brief overview of some of the tools. You can use formal assessments for trauma, like the child behavior checklist or the BASC, the behavioral assessment for children. Um, what I find on this one is typically the, if you have someone with developmental trauma, the atypicality scale will be high um, because their experiences are kind of outside the range of normal experience and they'll flag on that scale. There's a trauma symptom checklist for children and young children. Um, I use a sit cap assessment for baseline trauma symptoms and post intervention that assesses on those four domains of hypervigilance, intrusions, um, avoidance, and ch changes in cognition and mood. Um, you may, if you're in a setting where executive functioning is really important, like if you're working in a school, you may want to use the brief. I would use it more post-intervention to identify areas that may be still problematic. Um, if they're used in a, an initial assessment battery, they may be inflated due to the trauma symptoms, um, but it would still may be useful in your setting to help teachers maybe understand that these are things that are very difficult for the child. When trauma symptoms decrease, and they've gone through therapy and treatment, the brief helps identify those executive functioning impacts that may need some remediation to help support their education and skills. A developmental assessment is also really important. I use the mindfulness-based family, play family therapy, developmental history questionnaire that's from a training program that I, I went through. It identifies major events during specific developmental periods and the possible impacts on behavior and developmental tasks. So you need to have some type of developmental assessment to link these the impacts and the experiences that the children and teens may have had. You can do attachment assessment. So you can do your interview with the caregiver, observation of parent and child. You could do the Marshak or the MIM from play, TheraPlay that identifies four areas for supporting the parent with attachment-based parenting skills. When you're working with intergenerational trauma, assessment of intergenerational trauma is also really important. So that's where that five domains checklist that I've developed is specifically developed for the impacts of intergenerational trauma. It does give you a lot of information about attachment, negative self-beliefs of the child, things that can interfere with therapy. Um, so if you're interested in that, go to fivedomainschecklist.com and you can get a free copy and a training there. Um, intergenerational trauma assessment also wants to needs to identify significant traumas that impact the family across generations. So <clears throat> maybe war, um, POWs, um, residential schools, any kind of severe racial kind of um, experiences. So those are really gonna be important in, in looking at what we're dealing with in the current family situation, because those need to be integrated and the resilience of those previous ancestors to make it through those experiences needs to be harnessed and integrated into the family system. It also 
You want to identify patterns in the family system, so patterns of cutoffs, patterns of substance abuse, all that kind of stuff. Um, you also want to identify current stressors that contribute to continued trauma um, through trauma, traumatic experiences. So that's high crime, poverty, um, difficulties with educational systems, all of those kinds of things dealing with child welfare or child protection. Um, those are current stressors that can continue that trauma experience. So the benefits of using those structured assessments are they provide a baseline for the impacts and some can be used to assess progress over time or response to treatment. Um, they identify the most impactful interventions for individuals and in complex families. So you can kind of narrow down your treatment plan to address the specific impacts rather than just doing a, a treatment program that addresses everything. You can kind of tailor it and narrow it down which usually helps improve your outcomes. So assessments are usually used to guide therapy and the interventions you're using. So comprehensive assessment provides a comprehensive framework for treatment planning. <clears throat> you're able to have greater impact with individually tailored therapy programs than if you use those general interventions and just put everyone through the same, same intervention. Also provides, the assessment provides flexibility for specific needs of really complicated families rather than following just a highly structured program that may miss some of, miss some of the most impactful areas. And you may need to kind of reverse engineer some things where you may need to address the caregiver's unresolved trauma first and the child's before doing the attachment work. Or you may need to really calm that family nervous system do that attachment work, and then work with the, the trauma of both the caregiver and the child. It's all dependent on the situation. So with the intergenerational trauma program assessment, it helps identify the most efficient pathway for therapy. Do you, do you start with that parent coaching for attachment or their unresolved trauma? Maybe you start with the child. Maybe you start with both. So it's really important because of the complexity of intergenerational trauma, that we have that structure, but we also have flexibility. So just to recap our key points for today, we've looked at understanding developmental trauma, the impacts of trauma on development, looked at attachment disruptions in trauma, behavioral and emotional cues to that developmental trauma may be at play, consequences of overlooking developmental trauma, the impacts of developmental trauma in specifically adolescents, and assessments for developmental trauma. Um, so if you are looking for more resources, I mentioned the five domains checklist.com. Um, you can get that. It's a video training with the checklist that you could use in your practice. If you're interested in developing a deeper specialization, or becoming certified in um, intergenerational trauma therapy, you can go to apply.barbarawoodsphd.com and apply there, and we will have a conversation about it. Our next episode is going to be about creating safety in therapy for developmental trauma, and safety is the foundation of any other intervention, so it's important that we get that straight. So I will see you next time, and I hope you have a great day.